Oceanography class, let's go over chapter 3, Marine Provinces. Bathymetry is an understanding of what the topology is of the ocean floor. And that's understanding vertical distance from the ocean surface to the many different features on the landscape of our ocean basins, which includes mountains, valleys, plains, and other seafloor features, like volcanic features. And understanding the ocean floor really uh, has history uh, back uh, to 85 BC um, and soundings. So essentially what soundings are, um, navigators and, and sailors wanted to know the depth to the ocean floor in certain areas because they wanted to know whether or not their boat could pass through channels and rivers perhaps or bays. And so what they would do essentially is uh, drop a rock tied to a rope overboard and see how much rope uh, it would take to hit the bottom of the sea floor. That's essentially what a sounding is, <laughs> as scientific as that is. Um, and that technology was used for over 2,000 years to determine how deep the ocean floor was, right? But that's kind of like, if you think about it, if you're standing on a boat and you throw something overboard, you just know the depth to uh, the ocean floor from where your boat is, and that's one point. Imagine the vastness of the, uh, of the ocean and, say, Mediterranean Sea where these people were doing it. Um, it doesn't really give you a complete understanding of what the landscape is. Uh, underneath the ocean. Um, but yeah, that's that's essentially how, how uh, it, it had been done for so long. Um, a fathom, that's a unit of measure, which is about six feet. So one fathom, one fathom of depth would be, you'd be six feet underneath the ocean surface. Even the, the HMS Challenger, which if you remember from our first lecture, uh, was captained by um, James Cook. Um, they made soundings uh, all over the Pacific Ocean, and they made a lot of uh, systematic measurements uh, in 1872, and they actually found that the ocean floor, uh, the depth of the ocean floor varies widely depending on where you are. Okay, so what that means is the deep ocean floor has relief or changes in the quote-unquote elevation of the ocean floor. Okay, so there are variations in seafloor depth. Uh, later on, eco soundings were um, kind of invented. Uh, I guess the, the famous saying is necessity is the mother of invention. Um, and what happened, eco soundings were originally created or invented to um, alert ships of icebergs that were ahead of them. Remember, uh, a lot of these boats, remember like the Titanic, uh, they would travel the North Atlantic Sea at night, you know, so um, they would just go blindly in darkness and, and just hope that they could see an iceberg before they get too close to it and veer off in a different direction. But with eco soundings, um, it sends a, a sound signal, right? And it sends it out. Initially, it was done horizontally to detect those icebergs. So a sound is pinged off the boat. And if you receive a response, meaning that the sound reflected off an object and returned to the ship, that means that there's something there. So that's when you'd have to veer off. Um, and, and so eco soundings were very helpful for those ships because you could detect an iceberg well in advance of uh, seeing it so that you could adjust your navigation to avoid that, right? And so we wouldn't have to go through a whole um, Titanic situation again. Um, and then they started realizing that, what if you pointed it downwards, <laughs> right? So if you pointed the eco soundings downwards, the sound would travel to the, the bottom of the sea floor, um, hit the sea floor and reflect back up um, and be collected by a receiver on the boat. And depending on the, the timing of it, you could calculate the depth to the sea floor. So, the German ship Meteor was the first to uh, identify the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in 1925. Um, so slowly, um, uh, people started to realize that the ocean floor was complex and varied. 
Um, the problem with eco sounding is that it really lacked detail. So they, they knew there was a big ridge in the mid-Atlantic where they were kind of mapping, but they couldn't really tell exactly what it looked like. Okay. So it did, but it did provide a, uh, an accurate view of the seafloor, certainly um, uh, more data than, than soundings themselves. Okay. So here's an example of uh, an uh, eco sounding record. Okay. So here, this zero here would be the sea surface. So if you were a boat, you'd be up here. That's a lovely boat. Okay. So here is, um, uh, this would be onto the continents, right? So here's the continental shelf, kind of shallow, flat area uh, that leads towards the continent. Okay. And then it goes kind of much deeper. We call this the continental slope and goes off deeper and deeper. Uh, into the sea floor, okay? Um, uh, but the problem with, one problem with eco sounding is that between a depth of about 350 meters and 400 meters, there was something called the DSL or the deep scattering layer. Do you see these black lines here? This uh, gave a false bottom reading, meaning that the, the sound waves were interacting with something that was here and bouncing back but what this is uh, is a group of um, uh, of uh, organisms that uh, during the daytime they sink down to really deep layers, and at night they rise back up to avoid predation. But because they're in such large numbers here, uh, it actually affects the 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 data from uh, eco sounding. Okay, so th this is what uh, uh, a cross section of our ocean floor would look like using that technology. Later, precision depth recording uh, showed up in the 1950s, and that was high-frequency sound beams, and this really produced the first reliable seafloor maps. And this is what helped confirm seafloor spreading. Remember we talked about uh, seafloor spreading in plate tectonics? They used this technology uh, to confirm uh, that theory. Um, Later on, multi-beam eco-sounders were uh, invented. That is uh, multiple simultaneous sound frequencies. And so you can see a boat here depicts uh, the, the simultaneous sound frequency bouncing off the sea floor. And the boat kind of zigzags back and forth. And you get these swaths of data that you can collect. And then you stitch them together to create a, a larger map. Okay, And those swaths can be about uh, 37 miles wide. So it's kind of like, say, you're mowing a lawn and you just kind of go back and forth and back and forth and make sure you kind of overlap a little bit. Um, and so then you get a map of the entire area. Okay. Sonar um, is an acronym for sound navigation and ranging. Okay. This technology is also used in modern bathymetry and measuring or mapping the ocean floor. Side scan sonar is a technique where a boat tows. Um, an instrument uh, a little bit lower, and it provides really detailed images uh, of the ocean floor in pretty big swaths, around 30 kilometers. Um, and that provides kind of a, a really detailed bathymetric strip map, which you can see here. And then ultimately, um, the uh, most advanced technology we use today for understanding the, the ocean floor, remember, it that the ocean floor covers about 70% of the Earth's surface, so it's large, it's huge. Uh, more than twice the amount of surface that's on land uh, is underneath the ocean. So this is large areas that, to map. And so um, satellites have been very useful in this. And satellites can um, make measurements, and the measurements it makes of the ocean surface versus anomalies on the ocean surface um, we call them gravitational bulges. That reveals uh, major features of the ocean floor. Okay, so we have a satellite in orbit. It has a radar altimeter on it, and it sends pulses from the satellite to the surface of the Earth. And so it hits the ocean surface and then comes back to the satellite. All right, this here is the measured ocean surface, right? See this? Um, now, the theoretical ocean surface is where the ocean surface should be. But for some reason, there's this anomaly here. So you see that this is uh, a little bulge or an anomalous bulge that's on the sea surface. And the reason for this bulge, bulge is because when you have major features at the bottom of the ocean floor, 
um, you'll have water pile on top of it as a result of those major fe features on the ocean floor. So once um, scientists kind of realize this, they realize, wow, we can actually um, measure these uh, sea surface anomalies uh, to actually figure out and indirectly reveal what the ocean floor is like. So that was a huge step uh, in creating um, uh, maps that uh, we look at today. If you go to Google Earth or if you go on Google Maps and hit satellite, um, you can go out into the ocean and you can go out and see all the major seafloor features, mid-ocean ridges, you can see uh, 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 deep ocean trenches, you can see like, volcanic features, you can see um, uh, submarine canyons, which are pretty uh, crazy and intense. So, um, yeah, that's this is uh, satellite has provided a really uh, influential part in understanding our sea floor. Here's a comparison of a map generated by Eco Sounding and one generated by uh, satellites. So, from Eco Sounding to satellites, um, there's a, a, a an increase in the um, uh, detail uh, that you get from these maps. And these little etched cross areas are where boats kind of pass by. However, the multi-beam uh, um, type of uh, mapping provides the most detail. Satellites can't really distinguish um, really small features of the ocean floor. OK, so. Um, <clears throat> The reason why satellite-derived ocean uh, surface gravity um, uh, technology was so important is that it revealed areas where ships had not conducted research. Um, bringing a ship out to the middle of the ocean to uh, do multi-beam sonar is expensive. You have to have an entire crew, people to process the data, um, weeks at sea taking shifts back and forth, all the gas that's used to get the boat out there and bring it back, all that. That's very expensive. Um, so that's why satellites were, are super nice because they can just kind of orbit around, you know, really remote areas of the ocean uh, and map the ocean floor, okay? And um, the depth soundings were used to calibrate some of those sea surface height measurements to improve the data. And so here it is. This is essentially what you would see on Google Earth if you go to satellite mode or Google Maps, you can see that areas in blue are the deepest areas of the ocean floor. So you can see them along these areas. Uh, yellow, red, and white areas are shall shallower areas. Shoaler. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's another technique uh, that you can use to kind of take a look at the ocean floor. Uh, these are uh, but using seismic waves, and this creates seismic reflection profiles. And what's interesting about this is that uh, all the technologies we've been talking about just provide like what's on the surface of the ocean floor. Um, seismic reflection profiles actually let us know the different layers of the ocean floor. Because seismic waves, uh, some of them will bounce off the surface, but others will penetrate deeper, bounce through uh, uh, some, uh, some of the layers, and then come back up. Uh, and then you can use this equation to calculate uh, the distance to the ocean floor and the different layers. Okay, so this is nice because it kind of gives us an idea of what's below the surface. So we can have the ocean floor, we have very soft sediment, more firm sediment, and then we start running into rock layers. Okay, here's an actual seismic reflection profile that was collected. Um, and here, uh, here's, a, I guess, essentially a cross-section of the ocean floor. And then all the lines here, you can kind of see them here. The velocities of the seismic wave increase or decrease as they travel through different material. So then you can kind of draw what the different layers are here. And that's what you see in this one. OK. So as a result of all that emerging technology and going out and using satellites and mapping and all that stuff, three major provinces kind of uh, came into light uh, in our ocean basins. Uh, and there are continental margins. These are shallow water areas that are close to land. Um, and essentially, they're just a portion of the continent that just happen to be submerged uh, under the ocean's current uh, level. There's the deep ocean basins. These are far away from land. And then there are mid-ocean ridges, which are uh, a submarine mountain range. So let's jump to the Atlantic Ocean and look at the Atlantic Ocean Basin. 
And it's actually really nice. It's kind of nicely symmetrical. If we go from point A, I don't know, that's uh, Newfoundland or, no, wait, is that off the coast of Maine or Canada? I'm not sure here. All right. And if you go all the way to the west coast of Africa, B over here, this is a cross section from A to B. Okay. Um, and so if we start off in the United States, um, you've got a continental margin here. You've got the shelf, the slope, the rise. We'll talk about what that is. And then down into the deep ocean basin, right? Uh, and then we come uphill. Like if there was no water and you were walking here, you'd be climbing a mountain and you'd be climbing uphill to the middle of the mid ocean ridge right here. And then there's a distinguished valley, mid rift valley right there. And then you have a rise in elevation. And then the, uh, now you'd be going downhill. Okay, so there's a decrease in elevation going to the, on average, in the Atlantic, the deepest parts of the ocean, the deep ocean basin here. And then as you approach Africa, you'll hit the continental rise, then the slope, and then the shelf right here. So right along the uh, mid-ocean rift valley right here, it's almost, it's basically symmetrical across the Atlantic Ocean basin. We call that a passive margin. And the reason why it's passive is because it's not close to any plate boundary. There's no major tectonic activity, and the entire East Coast is on a passive margin, right? Um, we live in Florida, okay, so uh, we don't really experience many uh, earthquakes or tectonic activity living here, which we're, you know, grateful for. Wish we had fewer hurricanes, but still. Different areas of the world um, are different continental margins. They can have a lot of tectonic activity. We refer to those as active continental margins. Um, and they're associated with convergent plate boundaries or transform plate boundaries. Okay. So here's uh, another view of, uh, in this case, uh, from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of Africa, those are two passive margins. But here, this would be a passive margin over here where we have the shelf slope rise into the abyssal plain approaching the mid-ocean ridge area. So this is uh, a distinct province of the ocean floor. Uh, then you go back to an abyssal plain here. But what, look at the difference here. This is an active margin, okay? So what's going on here is that you have ocean lithosphere uh, subducting underneath other ocean lithosphere or perhaps even a continent. But this is active because th these two plates are uh, kind of converging on one another. So this is a convergent plate boundary. And what that does is create different types of ocean floor features. We have an ocean trench, deepest parts of the ocean floor. Um, we also have a slope here and then a more narrow continental shelf. So that's the difference between a passive and active continental margin. Um, active margins result from ocean continent or ocean ocean convergent plate boundaries. Um, they have active volcanoes a very narrow continental shelf, um, an offshore trench, which I showed you, those deep kind of almost V-shaped features of the ocean floor. Um, and we can find these off of um, uh, Western South America, or specifically an ocean continent convergent plate boundary off the coast of Western South America. So Chile, Peru, Ecuador, um, and one, the kind of uh, west coast of Colombia. A transform continental margin is not very common, and this is where uh, there's a continental margin, but there's a transform plate boundary. Um, and the reason why we talk about it is because uh, the southern uh, coast of California is a transform continental margin. So what you get are linear islands, banks, deep basins that are close to the shore. Um, and that <coughs> is uh, coastal California along the San Andreas Fault. Okay. So let's take a look at, at passive continental margin features in more detail. Um, so here's the continent, right? This is the beach where you all hang out. But in deeper waters, this will be the continental shelf. Largely flat area, slightly sloping kind of towards the deep ocean. Um, this is where we do most of our fishing, OK? Um, the width of it varies depending on where you are, OK? Um, like in Florida, the continental shelf width varies from the east and west coast. Uh, but it, it abruptly ends right here called the shelf break. And then that leads into the continental slope. And that can have uh, a slope of between like 5 and 25 degrees 
uh, towards the abyssal plane. So it's a very steep kind of the drop off essentially. Um, and on passive margins, we have another feature called the continental rise. And that's this area here because this area receives a lot of sediment that's either carried by wind or by rivers into the ocean. And that sediment kind of floats around and then is deposited on the continental rise. So it's a big kind of wedge of sediment that's depositing there. Uh, a lot of times on these slopes, there can be canyons that are cut through and sediment can kind of move down in that direction to deposit in these fans that are out here. And then beyond the continental rise, you go into the deep ocean and we refer to this area as the abyssal plain. Okay. So just to reiterate, the continental shelf is that flat area um, landward uh, away from the shelf break. Um, um, it's part of the continent, okay? Uh, its average width is uh, 43 miles, can, but can be as large as 930 miles. Um, and the average depth is about 135 meters or 443 feet. All right, here's the example of uh, that southern coast of California. Um, this is an active margin, so we'll call that a transform one because Here's the Pacific plate moving in this direction and the American plate moving in the opposite direction. So that's a transform fault. And so what it does is it kind of shears the land off and into the ocean. And then so that's why you have these kind of linear islands that pop up off the coast of California and very deep waters close to land. All right. And typically passive margins have much wider shelves than active margins. Okay. The continental slope, this is where the deep ocean begins. Okay. Um, it's similar to land on mountain ranges. Uh, the slope varies, but between 4 and uh, um, uh, 25 degrees is its gradient. And it's marked by canyons, and we call these submarine canyons where there's a lot of erosion. Okay. Um, these canyons are very narrow and deep. They're V-shaped. Um, and they extend from the base of the continental slope uh, down to uh, about 11,500 feet. And the way they're carved, so if we have, say we have a shelf break here, then there'll be a V-shaped kind of um, submarine canyon here, right? So imagine uh, this, this is where the sediment will be moving through and carving through that. Uh, these are currents. Currents laden or just uh, cover or, you know, just filled with water and fine sediment, kind of avalanching their way down through these canyons okay uh, we call those turbidity currents essentially they're underwater avalanches um, you can kind of imagine imagine a snow avalanche coming down the uh, mountain so there's heavy snow on the bottom and there's kind of light wispy snow on top and it kind of just moves down together so it moves a lot of uh, small rocks gravel and other tiny debris essentially just broken down uh, sediment from the continental shelf um, and it moves under the influence of gravity. Okay, so one, it wants to get down to the abyssal plane under the force of gravity. And so what happens is these sediments are deposited at the slope base once you get down closer to the where, where the continental rise essentially is. So you can see it here. Here's the shelf. Here are those submarine canyons that cut through um, the continental shelf here. And then you see these kind of uh, brown blobs here. Those are the deep sea fans or deposits of sediment that occur uh, in the ocean. These uh, avalanches, they move about 25 miles an hour. Now I know that doesn't seem very fast. It's like a, like a school zone for kids, but think of underwater. Try to run underwater. Isn't that weird? Isn't it? It's much slower than you would if you were running on land. So 25 miles an hour underwater is pretty fast. So this is what the, a cross section of a turbidity current would look like. And once they deposit, remember they occur uh, frequently. So if you have uh, the first turbidity current occurring here, this is number one, um, what happens is uh, the sediment will grade out. So the heaviest sediment will deposit first and then the light stuff will deposit on top of it. Okay, And then that's when the turbidity avalanche is over. And then here's the second turbidity current and, and then here the heavy stuff will deposit on top of the kind of next turbidity current and then there's another one. Okay. Uh, so you can actually measure the uh, uh, number of times there have been these these underwater avalanches with loads of uh, sediment depositing on the ocean floor. And eventually over time, um, 
that sediment can become compacted and become a sedimentary rock and we call those turbidite deposits and we often find these uh, on land in areas where there's uh, a convergent plate boundary because that kind of forces um, a lot of sedimentary rocks from the ocean floor uh, kind of raises them up onto land so uh, you can see that here on the on the coast of California um, these rocks uh, in the background here are a series of uh, uh, turbidity currents that have been preserved okay and uh, the texture is called graded bedding now the continental rise is just beyond the shelf break and the continental slope these are deposits uh, of a lot of sediment that comes from land. Okay, some of these are really big. The Indus fan that comes off the Indus River in India. Okay, uh, a lot of the Himalayan uh, rocks that are exposed at really high elevations are eroding away, and all that sediment gets pushed down the rivers and dumped out into the ocean. And this deposits into a huge uh, continental rise here called the Indus fan. Um, I think the Indus fan is approximately 11 kilometers thick, 11 kilometers thick of sediment just piled on top of each other, just remnants of the rocks of the Himalayan mountains just slowly to kind of eroding away and being taken out to the ocean. So that, those are the continental rises. And then beyond the continental rise, you get to the abyssal plains. These are the flattest areas on Earth, okay? Um, the sediment that arrives there arrives via suspension settlement settling. Very fine particles take up to 50 years to settle down to the ocean floor. And it's a combination of very slow settling velocities and also the average depth of the abyssal plains almost like four miles. So uh, there's a lot of sediment that deposits out in the uh, abyssal plains and that covers a lot of the ocean crust irregularities. Because remember, ocean crust is created by a volcanic rock called basalt, and um, that creates kind of for like a kind of irregular volcanic and rocky uh, ocean crust. But over time, as sediment deposits on top of it, it kind of blankets it and, and smooths it out, so to speak. So the uh, abyssal plains are well developed in the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. Here is the um, Atlantic abyssal plain. So it's these flat areas here, you see? There's not much going on in these kind of flat areas. Once you start approaching the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge region, um, then you start to see uh, kind of a more varied and jagged ocean crust. Uh, this is a lot of younger rock that's just been created right here at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, so hasn't had time uh, at the bottom of the ocean to have collected all that uh, sediment to kind of smooth it over. Um, and still, even in the abyssal plain, there are other ocean floor features like uh, remnants of volcanic activity. So uh, here's an, another image, of almost a cross section of the abyssal plains. So here, um, this is a kind of like seismic reflection profiles. So that we talked about, you can see the layering of sediments, and it reveals the kind of basaltic ocean crust uh, beneath it. This is the irregular ocean floor created uh, at those mid-ocean ridges, and this is hard rock, basaltic volcanic rock, um, and then essentially those sediments just deposit on the sea floor and kind of smooth it out. Okay, and here are those blanketed sediments you can see here. So some volcanic peaks kind of poke through the sediment. I don't know if you saw it on the last slide. There was a, what we call an abyssal hill. Uh, but these are, we give names to these features of the ocean floor. Um, sea mounts, table mounts, or guyats. Um, they need to be at least one kilometer above the sea floor. Okay. Um, to be referred to as a sea mount table mount. Okay, uh, abyssal hills or sea knolls are less than a kilometer above the sea floor. Okay, and if these volcanic features crest beyond the ocean surface, then they're volcanic islands. Okay, so here's a, an example of an abyssal hill, just barely above the ocean floor, less than half a kilometer. Here, this is, would be a sea mount, full-fledged volcanic feature essentially an underwater volcano um, and here's a table mount if you notice in table mounts they're they're given that name because of their flat top okay so they're not conical at the top they're flat top a lot of times the reason for that is because um, 
they were once above the ocean surface, but the uh, um, the ocean uh, kind of eroded and flattened the top of that um, sea mount, and now it's or volcanic island, and now it's submerged underwater as it's subsided and cooled down uh, into its table mount form. Okay, so now let's move on to the ocean trenches. Um, ocean trenches form at convergent margins. They're the deepest parts of the ocean. We find most of them in the Pacific, and by far the deepest is the Marianas Trench at 36,161 feet, which is incredible. So that's over here, the Marianas Trench is this red line right here. Uh, essentially, anywhere where you see these red lines are uh, areas where there's a convergent plate boundary and subduction, and so you'll find ocean trenches. Here's the Aleutian Trench, okay, Middle American Trench, here's a Cascade Trench here, and the Peru Chile Trench. There's two in the Atlantic. There's the Puerto Rico Trench right here, a little bit of subduction here, and then uh, the South Sandwich Trench over here. But most of the activity, if you notice, is in the Pacific Ocean Basin. And they refer to this as the uh, Pacific Ring of Fire because this is where a lot of the uh, active continental margins are. Okay, so what you get with convergent plate boundaries are volcanic arcs. Okay, um, you can have uh, a volcanic arc on the non-subducted ocean plate we refer to that as an island arc. Okay, essentially there are islands in the ocean that are volcanic in origin. Japan is the best example of this. And then um, if you have ocean crust kind of uh, converging on continental crust, um, the ocean crust will subduct into the mantle, creating that ocean trench. And then on the overriding continental plate, what you'll have are mountains that form on that land and also um, volcanoes will form on land as well. We call that a continental volcanic arc. So this image here is a cross-section of the Andes Mountains. So the Andes Mountains kind of run along the um, uh, along Chile and the uh, east coast of South America. And so when you have uh, subduction of that ocean crust, you create the Peru-Chile Trench, a very deep part of the ocean here, a uh, slope and a very narrow uh, continental shelf on this active margin. And then over here, you'll have uh, the buildup of mountains and, and volcanoes on land as a result of uh, the melting and the mantle that occurs down here. And we refer to that as a continental volcanic arc. All right, so yeah, the Pacific Rim of Fire just uh, surrounds the Pacific Ocean. This is uh, the, the belts uh, around the world that have the most active volcanoes and uh, active earthquakes or largest earthquakes. Um, they're all related to convergent plate boundaries, so plate tectonics helps explain that. Okay, so let's move on to the um, last province, the Mid-Ocean Ridge province. And these are the longest mountain chains that are found on Earth. Okay, uh, On average, they're about 2.5 kilometers ab above the surrounding sea floor. So again, if you were walking on the ocean floor, you'd be climbing up a mountain as you go towards the center of a Mid-Ocean Ridge. It's volcanic in origin. Uh, the eruptions are basaltic lavas that kind of spew out from these uh, open rifted areas and you get these uh, pillow basalts that form. Um, this, uh, these form as a result of two plates moving away from each other, a divergent plate boundary. And they can be uh, uh, approximately 1,000 kilometers wide on average and 75 kilometers long. So here's... Uh, a depiction of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay, so you can see here we are, the Florida coast with varying, uh, uh, a passive margin, right? We have varying um, a shelf width in Florida. This bleeds off into the continental shelf, into the abyssal plain, and then as we approach the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, it is a mountain chain that kind of runs through uh, the center of the Atlantic Ocean. And then right at the center of this, you'll find valleys, and that's where the volcanic eruptions occur as these two plates kind of move away from each other. Okay. So that's the Rift Valley. That Rift Valley is that area in the center. It's a downdropped area at the crest of the ridge, so like right at the center of the ridge. Um, a lot of times they're marked by fissures and faults, and you get a lot of small earthquakes here. Now, not, ev not every mid-ocean ridge is the same. Um, they're... Uh, 
their seafloor features um, uh, change depending on the speed at which the plates move. If you have slow spreading rates um, in a divergent plate boundary, uh, what you'll have is a very prominent rift valley like you see here. You can see here this is a low-lying area at the center of the rift. This is where the volcanic eruptions are occurring. Um, and then you get a lot of faults that form here, these normal faults. And then these are kind of really jagged. Um, at fast spreading ridges, and by the way, the spreading rates here at slow spreading ridges between 2 and, and 4 centimeters per year. Okay. Um, at fast spreading ridges, they can be anywhere between like 14 to 18 centimeters per year okay um, so what happens here because the plates are moving so much faster away from each other um, you have the formation of a very shallow magma chamber that's well developed closer to the surface and that allows for uh, more magma to kind of uh, migrate upwards and and all that heat creates kind of pops up the ocean floor here and so we call that a swell so you actually at, at fast spreading centers you don't have a rift, you have instead a swell, uplifted area, okay? At a slow spreading center, well, you'll have a rift, a kind of down-dropped area. Okay, so here is the example of all three. Down here is a slow sp spreading ridge, a cross section of it. So here's that rift valley, you see that? And they have hot, really high rift walls, okay? Um, the rift valleys can be between 500 and 2,500 meters deep and really strong flanks. Okay, um, this is our intermediate spreading rate. Okay, so like seven to nine centimeters per year. Okay, um, and so you have a less developed rift valley, but it is there. Okay, and not as prominent uh, flanks surrounding that rift valley. And then this is uh, like the East Pacific rise in the Pacific Ocean is a fast spreading uh, um, mid-ocean ridge and then here's that small little swell that'll form where most of the volcanic activity forms so this is where plates are moving in this direction okay and if you notice each one of these is uh you see those um, lines in yellow this represents the age of different crust right so three million years ago this was at the center of the ridge being created and so over the past three million years the plates have moved in this direction kind of pushing that rock away from the rift valley so in a sl in this slow spreading center it's pretty close to the rift valley once you start increasing the rate of spreading if you notice the three million year old crust is further away from the ridge and then in the fastest spreading rates um, they're way out here okay so here's uh, some some images of uh, mid-ocean ridge features these are the eruptions that occur uh, underwater. This is uh, basaltic lava kind of oozing its way out of cracks and fissures. And as soon as it touches that cold ocean water, remember it's like between two and three degrees Celsius, which is really cold, in instantly like cools down the, the lava and starts to form basaltic rock. And then it, it takes shape in the form of these pillows. And so that's why they call them pillow, pillow lavas or pillow basalt. Okay. Uh, the hot lava cools very quickly. In fact, 85% um, of the worldwide ac volcanic activity takes place underneath the oceans. Okay, um, and we didn't know about this until we started mapping the ocean floors. Okay, um, here is um, a so sonar mapping of the portion of the East Pacific rise. Now, this is a fast spreading center, so you can see here. Notice this is that swell. Okay, so this is the center of that. Uh, Mid-ocean ridge, the plate moving this direction, plate moving this direction. You can also see um, a seamount here, a volcanic seamount. So a lot of times um, magma will find a, a kind of an easier pathway to erupt at the bottom of the seafloor and then create these volcanic features, seamounts. These are uh, pillow basalts here um, uh, that are covered in ocean sediment. So they've erupted and cooled down a long time ago, and now sediment start starting to bury them. Um, and here are pillow basalts on land. Okay. Um, every year, about 12 cubic kilometers of seafloor is generated worldwide by the moving of these um, ocean plates away from each other at divergent plate boundaries. What we also find at Mid-Ocean Ridge, which is very interesting, are hydrothermal vents. Okay. Um, they were discovered in the 70s, and essentially these, are, uh, these vents um, are essentially chimneys that can be about 60 feet high, 
and they erupt this dark, mineral-laden, hot uh, water, 350 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's three and a half times the boiling temperature of water. So essentially, these are just erupting uh, superheated water, and it comes into contact with really cold ocean water, and so a lot of mineral material precipitates out of this black, kind of smoky, uh, mineral-rich water. So a volume of water equal to the wor world's ocean is thought to circulate through the hot ocean crust, okay, every 10 million years. So uh, the ocean crust is spreading open, right? And so all this lava is kind of coming upwards. But what that does is that, the, that means the ocean water can interact with that really hot basaltic rock. Uh, there are fissures and, and faults which uh, along those cracks, ocean water can kind of creep its way into the ocean crust. Um, and that can interact with the really hot rock, creating hydrothermal circulation. So a lot of interesting chemistry occurs at the bottom of the ocean there. Um, in, in addition to this, uh, we've discovered that, do you see this? This is, remember, this is the bottom of the ocean floor, a couple kilometers deep, um, meaning that there's no light here. So this is in perpetual darkness, but you can see that there's life here. So there's a really unusual ecosystems that are of, like able to survive without sunlight, which is um, for people or organisms living on the surface of the earth, that's typically the uh, basis of life. Um, so here, there's different types of hydrothermal vents. Here's a cross section of the ocean floor to, to show you what that looks like. Here's the kind of rift valley floor, and then here are those, hydro, those uh, uh, hydrothermal vents. And then ocean water kind of circulates downwards and is heated up by the hot rock down here and magma, um, and then it rises up and erupts and creates these kind of volcanic features or vents. Um, warm water vents uh, erupt water that uh, is below 30 degrees Celsius, or 86 degrees Fahrenheit, balmy, right? Um, white smokers are between 86 and 662 degrees Fahrenheit, and then black smokers, which I showed the pictures of, that's above uh, 350 degrees centigrade. It's really hot. So here you can see these are black smokers and over here are white smokers. All right, here are some more uh, hydrothermal vents and how they work. Infiltration of seawater, interaction with rock, and it erupts here and it'll leave behind a lot of sulfide deposits. Okay. So we're, this is kind of uh, some of the new discoveries we've been uh, uh, taking pictures of uh, in new areas along mid-ocean ridges. Okay, there are fracture zones and transform faults on the ocean floor. Um, and essentially we find them at spreading uh, zones. Essentially, because our earth is spherical, linear ridges will be offset. Um, and when they're offset, this creates a, 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 a fracture zone and also a transform fault that accommodates movement of these uh, tectonic plates, okay? So let's take a look at some. Here is, a, a, for example, a linear spreading center, the East Pacific Rise. Um, and as the Pacific Plate moves and the Antarctic Plate moves, um, what will happen is that you'll form, here are these fracture zones out here, and then here's a transform fault. And that just helps accommodate movement of the Antarctic Plate and the Pacific Plate. Let's take a closer look. What is this? This compares transform faults to fracture zones. Okay, well, we'll just show you here. Um, here's the axis of a mid-ocean ridge here, uh, another one here. So this is one tectonic plate moving in this direction and another one moving in this direction. Okay, and so as it's pushing in this direction, there's two different spreading centers pushing the same plate in the same direction, but it, pr it might be at different rates. So what happens is a fracture zone forms and they're kind of kind of uh, uh, sliding past one another. A lot of earthquakes are generated here. And then here, uh, from the ridge to ridge here, this would be the transform fault, okay? Because this portion of, of the crust is moving in this direction, and this portion of the different plate is moving in that direction. And so you'd have earthquakes that form in between here. That's the transform fault. Yeah, forgive, I'm like really messing up these images. But. And then over here, another fracture zone will form. So essentially the transform faults really just help accommodate uh, the uh, offsets between 
the mid-ocean ridges and spreading centers. Um, and then finally, uh, what we find on the ocean floor a lot of times there are a lot of there's a lot of volcanic activity or hot spots. Um, these are anomalously hot areas of the mantle that are upwelling, and what that eventually does is creates uh, island arcs or volcanic islands, uh, kind of like Hawaii. Okay. In other cases, you can have islands that are part of continents. Um, Japan's a good example too of, of volcanic islands that just kind of uh, like erupt and then emerge from the ocean. In fact, this here uh, is a volcanic island that that so there was a, a, a seamount underneath the ocean had a major violent eruption, and as it did, all the volcanic material kind of piled on top of each other and created a brand new smoking. Uh, volcanic island. So this is new land, right? So, I mean, it's got a volcano on it and it's active and uh, very unconsolidated material. So you couldn't really uh, inhabit it for a while. It'd be very dangerous. Uh, but still, this is how new islands form as a result of volcanic activity.